Major developments in the cold case of Kristen Smart, the college student who went missing nearly 25 years ago. Two men have been arrested, including a fellow student last seen with her, and police are crediting a podcast with the break in the case. A father and his son have just been taken into custody for their alleged role in the disappearance. There are disturbing new details tonight in the disappearance and murder of college student Kristen Smart nearly 25 years ago. Prosecutors in California said today that Smart was killed during an attempted rape by fellow student Paul Flores and his father helped hide her body. Kristen Smart's body may have been recently moved. Brand new evidence suggests her body may have been underneath the home of the father of that man suspected of killing her. Welcome back. We want to preview this case. This is the one we're going to bring you next here on Court TV. This is all about the death of college student Kristen Smart. The San Luis Obispo Cal Poly freshman went missing back in 1996 after she was last seen with Paul Flores, one of the defendants. He was a longtime person of interest in this case. Police arrested Paul and his father Ruben Flores last year after discovering some new evidence. Father and son will be tried at the same time, but will have different juries. That's important to know because they're going to be rotating in and out of the courtroom depending on the witnesses called. Now, jury selection uh, for Ruben begins today after a jury was selected last week for his son, Paul. Let's take a look back together now at this decades-old case. Here's Court TV anchor Ted Rollins. Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old college freshman at Cal Poly St. Louis Obispo when she vanished in May of 1996. She was last seen leaving a party with two other students. Kristen's disappearance has remained a mystery. Search warrants were executed in February of 2020, 24 years after she went missing. Police searched the home of Paul Flores, one of the students Kristen was last seen with, also searched were his parents' home in Arroyo Grande, California, and property in Washington State. Then police went back to look at Flores' home again. The searches appeared to be the break the Smart family had been waiting decades for. After years of calling Paul Flores a prime suspect, police finally arrested him for murder. His father, Ruben, arrested as an accessory to murder. Paul and Ruben Flores were arrested after investigators found biological evidence under Ruben's deck behind his home. According to the AP, there were traces of human blood and stains in the soil. The Smart family filed a lawsuit last April against Ruben Flores for severe emotional distress spanning nearly 25 years. It alleges Ruben relocated Smart's remains with the help of Paul's mother, Susan Flores, and her boyfriend, Mike McConville. Despite all of this, Smart's body has yet to be found. Wow, they're outside, there's a caution tape over there, and I'm like, this is real, there's, you know, I, I see police undercovers and I see you guys. I just pray for the Smart family and, and I pray that they, they get some finality to this. Kristen was pronounced legally dead in 2002, but this billboard with Kristen's face has remained a fixture on the California Central Coast since her disappearance, serving as a daily reminder of unserved justice. The distance between the last place she was seen alive and the door to her dorm building at Muir Hall is just about 40 yards. That's the voice of Chris Lambert on his podcast in your own backyard. It's a deep dive into Kristen's disappearance. The podcast renewed interest in the case and put pressure on authorities to solve it. On the walk back to her dorm, I think that Paul Flores took her instead to either his dorm or another location, attempted to sexually assault her, and I think that she lost her life in the process. Uh, Paul Flores, the defendant in Smart versus Flores, San Luis Obispo Superior Court case. Paul Flores has been the main suspect from the beginning, and he maintains his innocence. For years, the Smart family was frustrated with the local sheriff's department, but since a new county sheriff took over, things changed. Uh, we'll continue to focus on finding her remains, regardless of any court action. So we will continue the process of finding out where Kristen is. Uh, when I took office, uh, one of the first acts that I mentioned was re-examining starting from the beginning. Besides the podcast, there was also an army of Facebook supporters keeping Kristen's story alive. 
I think the best thing that we can do for Kristen and her family right now is what Kristen supporters like doing the very least but have gotten really, really good at is just being patient and waiting. All right, that was Chanley Painter reporting there for us, and Chanley is going to be heading there, covering this trial happening in California next week. Monday will be the day this case opens up, and uh, she'll be giving us live reports uh, throughout the day as we see what happens uh, finally with uh, this case coming to the point of trial. Been a long time. Let me bring in my guests. Josh Schiffer, April Sampson are the attorneys with me on the show today to help me unpack uh, this case. Uh, April, let me begin with you, if I may, please. Um, tell me, you know, and you've practiced on both sides of the courtroom. You've worked as a criminal defense attorney. You serve as a prosecutor now in South Carolina. Um, what are the challenges that you see for the state of California with this case that uh, went cold for so long? Well, it's always challenging when it's an old case, first of all, because witnesses have died, moved, evidence may be gone. I think the other thing that'll be difficult is they don't have a body. Um, for us here in South Carolina, that would be difficult because we only have murder. So how do you prove how they died and that it was with malice and all of the things that we need? So I see that that could be an issue in, in charging him with having done something to her is you don't have the body to prove what he did to her. Right, right. We know that there have been allegations that there might have been sexually assaultive behavior that happened and the death that happened subsequently. Uh, so to your point, April, which is a great one, no body, um, good for the defense. Uh, Josh Schiffer, if you're on the defense side of this, what are you going to be capitaliz capitalizing on, please? Well, just some of what April was just mm -hmm. referring to, the distance and time, it just dulls the details. We have a high standard of, of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for a reason. It is better better to let a thousand guilty people go free than wrongfully incarcerate the innocent. And they're going to uh, harp on that as the defense. There's no question Flores was considered a suspect from the very beginning. There was other litigation in the interim. What new came about that justifies a prosecution? The defense is going to probably put the system on trial to a degree. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, have either of you ever seen this in your years of practice? And April, I'll go to you first, please, where you've got two separate juries because the charges they're facing are very different. Dad, Ruben Flores, is not being accused of having any involvement in the murder. It's just the son, Paul Flores, who's facing that accusation. Dad is being accused of helping him after the fact cover things up. Um, so uh, the judge is allowing two separate juries to hear the cases against them so that, for instance, you know, the jury uh, that might hear some really, really terrible facts that Paul Flores allegedly did, they won't hold that against Ruben. Uh, so they're not going to hear certain things. April, have you ever had this where you've had co-defendants with different juries for one reason or another? Yes, um, we have a lot of times you'll have to try co-defendants separately. Sometimes one may have confessed or may have put the other one in it and you can't try them together because you can't force one to testify. For a, a defendant always has the right to confront their accusers and so if you can't put that accuser on the stand because they're also accused of the crime, then you can't try them together. So having separate trials is not unique. Having them at the same time is. I don't know if that was done to placate someone, but that is that is something I've never been part of. I thought that was just something you saw on TV. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I wonder if it's for the sake of judicial economy. Uh, quickly, Josh, we just have a couple seconds. Do you think that may be why? Uh, yeah, there was something that justified it. I don't know exactly what it is, like April's referring to, but something justified doing this at the same time. I've never heard of it happening anywhere. There was a reason, really fascinating to find mm -hmm. out what it is. So you've never seen it in Georgia? No. You, you practice no. in the state of Georgia? Georgia yeah. and other places. Never seen them at the same time. Is it, say, is it just one judge or is it two judges? How does that work? Really unique. Yeah, no, it really is. Um, and so we're going to be there again. Chanley Painter is going to be reporting on this one for us. Starts on Monday, the Kristen Smart case. A uh, long time in coming, long time in coming uh, for this one to get to the point of trial.